For a couple weeks now, there has been much ado about Intel Bartlett Lake rumors, with most articles characterizing this product as some sort of Zen 3 AM4 competitor meant to turn LGA 1700 into a proper budget platform below LGA 1851 long term. But here's the thing. According to multiple sources at Intel that I spoke with, I'm hearing that we really shouldn't be sure Bartlett Lake is all that interesting to consumers. The first source that I spoke to at Intel said that as far as they are aware, Bartlett Lake was never intended for client. And while they guess they could see some CPUs uh, hit yourself in OEM, it won't be because it's budget at all. Intel 10 nanometer is very expensive. And this is just a public fact now. We've seen an IFS earnings reports that it is woefully uncompetitive in pricing compared to TSMC's current nodes. And so if the idea was to keep using this, well, really drawn out an expensive node for as long as possible, I do not think that's Intel's plan at all, at least not for budget users. Now, the second source I spoke to at Intel said that Bartlett Lake is for networking and edge, and maybe also for high frequency trading, but not for general consumers. Furthermore, if the microcode update for Raptor Lake isn't effective enough, they might even need to drop the clocks on Bartlett Lake so they won't break. And if that happens, it's not going to be competitive with AMD's products in 2025 at all. So yeah, look, uh, Bartlett Lake, it exists, but it isn't on a lot of people's radar because it really shouldn't be if you're someone who wants to buy this for a gaming rig or something. It, it is coming out so late as well, rumored to be coming like a year from now, that I just don't think it'll be competitive with anything AMD has out at the time. So yeah, I don't think it's that interesting to talk about Except, well, you know, you probably noticed from the title and thumbnail of this video that there is something worth talking about in Bartlett Lake, and that's that it seems to have the same hardware flaw in it that Raptor Lake has. Now, of course, when that source, source number two from the slide, told me that it had basically the same flaw as Raptor Lake, I, of course, immediately followed up, and then we had a long conversation about what is probably making Raptor Lake products break. And so now if I put these quotes on screen, source number one here with source number two on the other side, the person told me, that the leading theory inside Intel right now is that the ring bus is getting cooked because it's fed by the same rail as the P and the E cores. Remember, they even doubled the amount of E cores. And Raptor Lake required incredibly high voltages to hit the clocks required to be competitive with Zen 4. And it seems like it was just pushed too hard, that the ring bus is getting cooked by these high voltages that are connected to making the P cores clock incredibly high, and that this is an inherent flaw that would also be in Bartlett Lake if Bartlett Lake is overvolted as much as Raptor Lake. Now, the good news is that this person tells me that Meteor Lake isn't affected and that Emerald Rapids is unlikely to be affected materially as well. So then I took this information. I reached out to one of my longest running sources at Intel, someone who's been instrumental in so many leaks, and I said, is this true? Does this make sense to you as an explanation? And the person said that they never directly worked on Raptor Lake, but that they did have exposure to Alder Lake, and they can confirm that the team working on Alder Lake was very concerned about the ring bus getting damaged if the voltage was pushed too high. And then this person also confirmed that Raptor Lake was rushed through their design and validation process really quickly. So perhaps they just didn't catch this as a problem in many of the yields. Now, a third source I reached out to, I called up, this person works at Intel Foundries, and they did confirm, again, that Raptor Lake was rushed through their fab in Arizona in record time. But it is produced in other fabs, not just produced in this fab in Arizona. However, this location is notable, though, because they can confirm that there was an oxidation issue caused by some failures in the HVAC system at this plant between March and June of 2023. It was so bad that Kayvon Esfarjani had to fly in to make a decision about which wafers needed to be thrown away, which is a really big decision because each wafer, I'm told, costs as much as a Model X. And to be clear, though, this person doesn't know what the decision was, like which parts were thrown away, uh, which at what stage in the manufacturing process they said, hey, anything before this we have to throw away. This person doesn't know that. It's above their pay grade. But they do know that this happened and a decision like that was made and also that this, this would have affected Sapphire Rapids. So if oxidation were to be the main issue for Raptor Lake failures, you should expect to see that in Sapphire Rapids products as well. Now, pro oxidation probably is a contributing factor to all the failures we're seeing, but it doesn't sound like it's the main one. Although I do have to say, it's really interesting. Guess who just left Intel? 
Kayvon Esfarjani. This timing is insane. And so, you know, after talking to all of these people, literally anyone I know at Intel that I could get on the phone this week, I have to say that I'm fairly confident that I know what is going on with Raptor Lake, and it is not just one thing, and I want to summarize the whole situation to you all, and also tell you what I'm being told you should expect in terms of, like, how well it will work out of that microcode update in August. But first, an ad from a sponsor. All Jesse wants is for Maurice to play with her more often. But unfortunately, he just does not give out playtime or kisses for as low of a rate as she does. And I think she's just going to have to deal with that. But do you know what you don't have to deal with? Paying too much for Microsoft software if you go to cdkeyoffer.com. This piece of content is sponsored by cdkeyoffer.com and their back to school sale. Whether it's Microsoft operating systems, office products, or even many of the latest games, cdkeyoffer.com provides PC gamers with a product this community deserves amongst endlessly elevating component costs, Fair pricing on Microsoft keys is one thing that we at least should get, I think. And, you know, the Moore's Law is Dead team has been working with CDKeyOffer.com for a very long time. And that's because they're good to me, good to Dan, good to about a dozen family members of friends of mine that have used their services. And they've been really, really good, most importantly, to the Moore's Law is Dead team community so support this channel by using offer code broken silicon to save 25 percent off microsoft software or you can also use die shrink to save three percent off everything else on the website like games using either of those codes really helps the channel a ton and it helps save you money so use those codes broken silicon and die shrink at cdkeyoffer.com today all right so now let me summarize the three not one the three main issues that i believe are causing failures in so many mini raptor like chips and the first one is that i think intel is just binning way too many chips too high with an architecture that just probably isn't as robust as Alder Lake. I mean, think about it. Raptor Lake was hastily thrown together in record time, and its entire shtick was that we added more cores to the same design and also upped voltages a ton. Something that you rush out there with really high voltage, that just seems like you're asking for problems to me. And I believe that in conjunction with the fact that it's just rushed at too high of a voltage, Intel is pushing far more i7s to become i9s in order to meet demand than they should be. And now, to be clear about what I mean by this point, what I'm saying is that though Raptor Lake actually is better than Alder Lake in an apples-to-apples -apples sort of way, like, you know, Raptor Lake does require less voltage for the same clock speeds, I still believe that most of the yields cannot handle it as well as Intel thought they could when they were preparing Raptor Lake. And what gives me so much confidence in this idea is that I've long heard since even Intel 13th gen that Intel can't make enough i9s to meet demand. And so it wouldn't surprise me if there was a lot of pressure to push as many i7s as they can into i9s. And maybe they just underestimated how many of them really shouldn't be pushed that hard. And in fact, that makes even more sense when you consider the disastrous earnings you are seeing with Intel right now and the bad margins. The products with the highest margins are i9s. And so I would guess that Intel was desperate to push as many chips as hard as they can to keep good margins. Now that's the first problem, over binning and not really testing Raptor Lake as much as they should have. But the second problem is that there actually is though, it, unrelated to that, there is actually an inherent flaw in Raptor Lake, I am told. You know, Raptor Lake doubled the e-cores while still having the ring bus and the P cores and the E cores all on the same rail. And so if you think about that, how high they push those voltages, what I'm told is that a problem arises when the V drop causes VID to exceed around 1.5 volts. And then, well, it cooks itself. And of course, the more P and the E cores you have at the higher voltages in a CPU, the quicker that CPU is going to break itself, which is why you're mostly just seeing the highest core count, highest clocked models break, at least for now. And that's why occasionally disabling e-cores when the instability starts to happen can fix it. But it's still likely going to break eventually. And if it's completely broken, disabling the e-cores isn't going to do anything. Now, the reason I still think, though, that some chips are never failing, because a lot of people are saying that some chips, no matter how long they run them at high voltages, they're not failing, is that I just think those chips are golden samples. It can probably handle it. Intel is bending way too many imperfect chips into the top end with an inherently flawed architecture. And so unless you have a golden sample, 
a lot of them are going to break. Although if you do have a golden sample, I mean, they did design the architecture for higher voltages. It wouldn't surprise me that some of them actually can take it. Now, finally, the third issue. Yeah, look, I am told that there is something wrong at Intel's Arizona fab. And actually, I would like to put this out there. I like to request that fellow tech tubers or devs or people who have access to a lot of data look at their samples and look up the batch number. Uh, I believe if you take that batch number and inquire to Intel where it was manufactured, they would tell you. So we can figure this out. Look, I don't think oxidation is the main cause of Raptor Lake failures. I do think it could be contributing to it though. And if you want to prove it, then prove it. We can take the failed products of Raptor Lake. We can look at their batches. And if they're all coming from the Arizona fab, which I am told is the one with the oxidation issue, then we can prove if it is or isn't from that. But if it is from that, I would expect to see more Sapphire Rapids failures as well, especially more Sapphire Rapids failures in the second half of last year, and then have those failures go away. That would prove some of the oxidation stuff but I don't have that data, but I'm sure someone else out there does. But anyways, what if you do have a Raptor Lake chip right now in your system? Should you expect that microcode update that's coming out in August to actually be a good enough mitigation for the issues to go away for you to stop worrying? Well, what I'm basically being told, and now keep in mind, this is coming from people within Intel. We're not really going to know until it's tested in the wild, and they're probably biased towards this, but... What I'm hearing from within Intel is that they actually do expect that the microcode mitigation will only have a single digits performance hit. Some people think it'll be very, very, very minor and that they do genuinely themselves honestly believe that it will massively improve the longevity of the chips. But think about what I'm saying here. You're still going to probably get some slight performance loss and it's improving the longevity. It isn't a complete fix. It just means that if you have an i9-14900K, assuming it hasn't already been eroded enough for it already to be a problem, that once this microcode update is out, it will take years, not months for the chip to break, but that this is still probably something that will eventually break sooner than some battle-hardened architecture that lasts for decades, like we sometimes see when people brag about still using Sandy Bridge. And, you know, I've actually got to say that even if the microcode update does work well, like there's a minimal performance losses in the systems that get the microcode updates, well, those CPUs last for many more years. I still don't think that's going to be enough to really save Intel from this mounting PR and financial disaster that they are hurling into right now. The, the OEMs and motherboard manufacturers that I speak to expect the rollout of these microcode updates to be very chaotic and uh, tons of people are worried about like, well, maybe we'll handle it well, we hope, but like, what about that other motherboard manufacturer that had a terrible baseline like update that like broke BIOSes? Like, how is that not going to happen again with this? And frankly, are we really sure there's going to be a way to force most Raptor Lake users to get this microcode update? Like, I'm sure, you know, uh, enthusiast gamer watching this channel, you know, you, you, you've got your ear to the rail, you're very involved online and learning about all of these little updates. I'm sure you'll update your system. But what about all of the casual gamers or people that just bought a laptop to use at home and don't pay attention to this news? Like... Are they really going to be fiddling in their BIOS or is there really going to be a safe way to force the microcode update in like a Windows update in a way that doesn't end up also causing other problems once they try to do that? I just think there's no way around the fact that there's going to be a mountain of millions of RMAs that Intel is going to have to be dealing with for years now. And the PR damage, I mean, it's... It's already done. This is just blowing up into bigger and bigger and more mainstream websites. And even if someone has a like a Intel laptop that isn't one of the dies that's likely to break, I can't help but think that if this keeps getting more and more mainstream, that you could see someone just sitting at home, their laptop breaks, they see the Intel sticker, and they go, well, there it is. I'm not using them again. I mean, think about do-it-yourself gamers. Like, no one that I've spoken to is excited to buy Arrow Lake right away with this problem. They're going to want to wait months or a year to see if Arrow Lake has the same problems that Raptor Lake has. This is just a complete PR disaster. And, well, I guess I'll also say that, yeah, AMD is capitalizing on this, delaying Zen 5 with tons of transparency so they can probably both launch next to Intel's slightly nerfed chips once they're updated, uh, and so they'll look a little worse in the benchmarks, but also so that they look like a good guy. But, you know, I do want to be clear about this Zen 5 delay thing going on right here. Well, I have no doubt that AMD is happy to play up 
the fact that they seem to be being more honest than Intel. And I'm sure they are also very happy that Intel may have a slight performance nerf right next to a Zen 5 launch that they've delayed. I don't think that they just did it for those reasons. I do believe that AMD probably found a minor defect in a small batch of their chips, one that they could probably have just rolled the dice on and said, hey, it's not a big defect. The most of them are probably fine. I mean, we'll just arm a the small amount that break. You know, we could get away with it. I think they could have done that, but I think maybe they'd learn from the 7900 XTX vapor cooler defect, a completely stupid wave of unnecessarily bad PR that just hit them because like 20% of one batch had defective coolers. I think AMD's learned. I think that's what we should take away from this Zen 5 delay is that AMD has learned that even if it isn't a huge deal, uh, even if you're worried that being honest about it would create more bad PR, that being honest about it is actually what stops all the conspiracy theories from going around and making you look like you're hiding something more than you really are. That is what I think is going on with AMD's Zen 5 delay right now. And I do think that this is really the thing to close on with this video is how absolutely ridiculous it is that multiple tech channels are forced to do basically investigatory journalism to find out what the heck is going on with Intel's products instead of Intel being honest and upfront about what they know and what they don't know to the point that even people at Intel, I have new sources, by the way, too, who contributed to this video, are reaching out to me because they want to know what's going on with their own company's products. That is so chaotic, and in my opinion, that shows that there's just something wrong with the leadership at Intel right now if they can let this go on that long to the point that their own employees are gossiping about the issue. And yeah, that's basically all I have left to say on this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure that you like it, that you comment down below for the algorithm, and also that you share it. I actually think sharing this video is more important than usual because the findings that I have in it could assist other tech tubers in their investigations, like I was speaking with Wendell offline the other day, and I know that he is continuing his work as well. You know, the more we share this stuff, the more we're going to get down to the bottom of what's going on here, and then also consider joining the Moore's Law Z Patreon as well. This is a lot of work done by multiple people that need to put bread on the table, and so I'd really appreciate anyone who can support it that extra two, four dollars, or whatever you can afford a month. You'll get tons of exclusive ad-free content like the Die Shrink Catalog, a new one just came out. Billy ask us questions, you can join the Discord and talk to me right now about what you thought about this video and talk to thousands of other patrons as well that are supporting the channel. I cannot do this without our patrons, but you know what? I will also say this. If you made it this far into the video, at a minimum, thank you for watching. <laughs>